in the previous session on software development, we looked at what drives industrial scale software development. Okay, the economic drivers that dictate everything else. As a result, conventional software development has to be done in a particular way. And I said that that doesn't work for software safety. In this session, we're going to talk about why that is. So I'm going to present some software safety facts that answer the question, how does software really hurt people? And then by looking at those facts, we can see why conventional software development techniques don't work for software safety. So first of all, we need to understand how mistakes made in software can lead to failures and ultimately accidents. And this is illustrated well by this standard, BS 5760. What we see is that during development, people either on their own or using tools make mistakes, okay? And that's inevitable. And there will be many mistakes in the software as we will see in a moment. These mistakes can lead to faults or defects being present in the software. Again, inevitably, some of them get through to uh, in use period. Okay, so if we jump over the fence, the software is now in use. There are all these faults inherent in the software, but usually they lie hidden. Okay, until some revealing mechanism comes along and triggers these latent faults. And that revealing mechanism might be a change in the environment, an operator uh, scenario, or a change in inputs that maybe the, the software is seeing from sensors. Okay, so environment operator or input changes can reveal or activate these latent faults. And that can cause errors in the software at runtime while the software is running. Now, that doesn't mean that a failure is inevitable because lots of errors don't lead to uh, you know, failures that actually matter, but some do. And that is the chain of how we get from mistakes to faults or defects in the software to runtime errors to failures that become apparent outside the software. Okay, so that's uh, a very useful model and um, reliability people may get uh, upset about that or, or disagree with it, but I would say broadly that is what happens. Okay, I'm not here to argue the theory. Overall, this is what we see happening. Now in that model, I said that the fact that there are mistakes may lead to defects and there's lots of defects in the software but they're probably lying latent this is the proof of that so long time ago a very well known paper in the ibm journal of research looked at how long it took faults in uh, ibm operating system software to become failures for the first time and bear in mind this is an ibm operating system so it is a very well engineered system we are not talking about you know cowboys uh, producing software on the web that may or may not work okay or you know people in their bedrooms producing apps we're talking about a very uh, sophisticated product here that was in use all around the world but interestingly what adams found was that a lot of software uh, faults took more than 5,000 operating years in order to be revealed to become apparent. And in fact, he found that more than, or sorry, 90% of faults in the software would take much more than 50 years to become failures. Okay, so there's two, two things that this tells us. First of all, in any significant size piece of software, there is a huge reservoir of faults waiting to be revealed, okay? So if people start telling you that their software has got no defects or no faults on it, um, either they're dumb enough to believe that or they think you are. 
But what we see in reality is that even in a very high quality software product, there are a lot of latent defects, okay? And many of them, the vast majority of them, will take a long, long time to reveal themselves, okay? So that is, one, uh, that is a fundamental reality of our software. Uh, all software, it's got a lot of latent defects sat in it. Now, the good news, I refer back to the, that software failure model that I spoke to you about. Just because software has an error at runtime doesn't mean that it's going to hurt anybody. So if we look on the left-hand side of the diagram, we've got some software running on a computer. The software has some internal state. It's got some data set up in certain ways and it's seeing some inputs from the outside world. OK, and those inputs might be caused, as we remember, by the environment, might be operator inputs or they might be um, some sensor inputs to the software. So the software basically combines its internal state in those inputs and the result may be uh, a runtime error. OK, now, whilst that's within the computer, that's fine. Who cares how many errors there are in the computer? Because software errors in isolation cannot hurt anybody. You know, they're just they're just logical state within the software. It doesn't hurt anybody. Where the hazard can arise is where the outputs from the software and ultimately from the, the hardware that supports it begin to impinge on the real world. So either we're using this software to control something, okay, so the software might directly control something like a vehicle or an aeroplane or a ship or a nuclear reactor. And if the software goes wrong, we can misdirect whatever it is we're controlling, okay? Or we're using the software to generate information which humans will use to make a decision. So the software uh, might be used by a pharmacist to say okay you know which which drugs are available uh, to match this prescription uh, or might be giving advice to somebody or it might be a display on a vehicle whatever it might be the software is doing something it's either controlling something or it's giving information to people in order to support decision making and that is where the hazard can arise because now the software is affecting the real world where people live and work and play. But even so, just because there's a hazard doesn't mean that there's necessarily going to be an accident. This hazard, um, this uh, failure has got to propagate through the system. It's got to work itself up through the, the equipment, maybe a subsystem system, it's got to work itself up to the platform level and then to begin to affect the environment, OK, with people in it. Even then, you know, the mind, probably a minority of cases will not result in an accident. It will not result in harm to people. There may be a range of outcomes, which is what the expanding triangle is meant to represent. There may be a range of outcomes. Some of those outcomes will be a non-accident outcome. So something completely harmless, nobody notices even, maybe an incident, we have a near miss, people think that wasn't good, that was wrong, nobody gets hurt, or there may be an accident where harm comes to somebody, okay? But there's lots and lots of stages here between an error in the software at runtime leading to an accident where somebody gets hurt. So it's quite a convoluted progress to get from one side to the other in the accident sequence as we call it so that's the good thing about software many times it can go wrong and nothing bad happens at all now that was the good news the bad news is that a lot of the time um software that is working perfectly and is doing exactly what it is supposed to do can still hurt people these results here are the results uh, from a, an informal survey uh, carried out uh, by uh, a researcher who was interested in this over many years and he collated lots and lots of public reports of computer related accidental death. Now this is not a terribly scientific way of doing it but as you can see the results are so overwhelming and it was quite a large 
um, it was quite a large um, sample that he took, over a thousand deaths. And as you can see, more than 90% of those deaths were probably caused by the human computer interface. Okay, whereas software error actually accounted for less than 3% of those deaths. And then we've got, we've got other things, you know, like cosmic rays or, or whatever, upsetting the software and, and the hardware, or we've got physical causes like, um, I think there was a, one was a, there was a fire in the building where the computer was installed, so the computer failed. Again, nothing to do with the software, but physical causes can take down you know the hardware on which the software sits but the vast majority were caused by problems with the interface with humans and we'll um, hear about some examples of those in a later session so actually what we need to worry about so much is not having errors in the software it's people you know misunderstanding what the software does and uh, and that results in not very nasty consequences. And then finally, there was a very useful survey done by the UK Health and Safety Executive. And it was done, um, there were two different um, sets of surveys done several years apart. In the intervening time, the technology of industrial control systems changed quite dramatically. Um, but what's interesting is these results didn't change. So, so these results are not about technology, they're looking at what caused industrial control systems to go out of control, as the title says. And again, we can see that a relatively small percentage of um, incidents and accidents, because not every incident actually hurt somebody. There were lots of near misses as well as injuries and deaths. But we can see that only about 15% of those incidents or accidents were due to errors in the design and implementation. In other words, the design or the code, okay, because these is all about software control systems. Okay, by far the biggest contribution were errors in the specification, in the requirements, what the software was supposed to do. Um, another fifth were changes after commissioning, in other words, so modifications that people made. And then another 15% were uh, errors in operation and maintenance and then installation and commissioning. So 85% of those incidents and accidents with control systems were not caused by errors in the code. The code was doing what the specification said it should all along, but still we had an accident or incident. If we take all of those things together, we've got some pretty shocking, I think, uh, implications for software development. So a lot of the time in software development, we're worried about the design of the software and coding it. And we're worried about how many bugs have we got in the software? And is it going to, uh, you know, overwhelm our development program and cause it to fail? Is it going to prevent us from getting a working software product? We're putting a lot of effort into testing that software as early in the life cycle as possible. So we're doing unit testing first before we integrate the system progressively, because that's what we do to reduce program risk. So we, we do that to catch errors as early and as cheaply as possible so that we get a successful program that delivers a product. But it turns out that software safety really has got not much to do with those things. So all those things that we're investing money in in conventional software development to get a product that works are actually pretty irrelevant to software safety, which is quite a horrific thing when you think about it. And instead, software design is all about other things, or sorry, safe software design is all about other things. It's about understanding the context within which the software works, because of course in isolation, software cannot hurt anybody ever. So it's all about context. And secondly, it's what we are asking the software to do. We've said we want the software to do X, Y, Z. Well, what if X, Y, Z is wrong? What if it should have been A, B, C? The software works perfectly according to the spec, but if the spec is wrong, we're doing the wrong thing. And thirdly, 
we need to worry about the human interaction with the software because software is complex, it's intangible. Humans, particularly operators who may have had nothing at all to do with the development of the software, they will have no clue about how the software works unless we tell them. If the displays that they're working off um, uh, are not well designed, then that can trigger errors or erroneous human behavior. OK, so if we design the system wrong, we can easily trigger a human to do the wrong thing. Not the human's fault. We don't call it human error anymore. It's erroneous human behavior and it's often triggered by bad design. OK, particularly of the human interface. And then finally, through the life of the software, which may be very long in, in some of some systems, we need to control change. We need to understand what was the original intent of the software. What you know, what was the what was the original context and the requirements and the specification? Because these things change over time. The scenario, the people that are operating it, the environment change over time. Okay, this is a well-known software theory. I'm quoting here. So things change in the real world. If we want to modify the software to keep up, or we choose not to. We need to understand what the original intent was of the software versus what we're doing with it now. If we lose that audit trail, as it were, then that can cause accidents, very severe accidents, as we will see later. So software, safe software design has got to address those things on the right, on top of the fact that we need a successful product that actually works, which is you know, what the things on the left are designed to do. So those are the implications for safe software design. It's not about the things that we're used to being told it's all about. It's about something else entirely. And so that brings me to this short session on software safety facts. And that's the last free session in this course. To go beyond this, you'll need to buy the course. And then we'll start to talk about what we actually do to meet these needs and these challenges. What are the principles of safe software development that we need to see in every software standard in order to make it work? What are the fundamental principles that we need to make safe software?